Welcome, everyone. Um, it's so wonderful to see so many new people joining us this evening. Um, I am Melody Arndt, the MPT Development Coordinator, and I would also like to introduce uh, Mary Hanna, the MPT Operations Manager, if you could kind of woo -hoo, wave. <laughs> <laughs> Um, MetaPeace team's vision is a just world grounded in nonviolence and respect for the sacred interconnectedness of all life. It is through the action and support of individuals like yourself that MPT will be able to continue moving toward this vision. And I just wanted to take this moment just to say thank you very much for that. Just as a quick reminder, we'll be holding all of our questions until after the presentation. And I would like to ask for everyone to remain muted um, and during the program. And with that, and just to keep us moving forward, um, I would like to introduce you to our dynamic speaker, Dr. Christopher Smith. Dr. Smith has been a professor of criminal justice at Michigan State University since 1994. Prior to teaching at MSU, he taught political science at the University of Akron and the University of Connecticut Hartford. In 2021, he was inducted into the School of Justice Wall of Fame. Yay! Um, additionally, he has authored or co-authored more than 20 books and authored more than 100 scholarly um, articles. Chris is also the board chairperson and acting executive director of the Michigan Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence. The Michigan Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence is a national nonprofit um, focused on supporting gun violence prevention programs. They work collaboratively um, to prevent gun violence through community education and beneficial gun policies. It is my great honor and privilege to prevent Dr. Chris Smith. Thank you. Um, I fear you've raised expectations um, <laughs> and hopefully I'll uh, meet them. Uh, it's, you know, it's always an honor to get a chance to talk to people about important issues, especially people who are genuinely interested, because I spend much of my life speaking to audiences of young conscripts um, who are not always enthusiastic about hearing the sound of my voice. So I do look forward to this. I do look forward to questions you may ask. And now I will attempt after having been taught by Mary and Melody to share my screen uh, so you can see the slides. There, is that working? Okay. Um, so you already um, heard who I am. Um, and I've taught about the Second Amendment for really my entire career. That's getting close to four decades now. Uh, and I've also taught about public policy for much of my career. So, you know, my interest really is in combining that knowledge about law concerning guns with um, my understanding of the policy process and policy analysis and the evaluation of beneficial policies. So my orientation tends to be toward advocacy of law and policy. I don't have so much expertise and experience with some of the alternative approaches to gun violence that would really be more peacemaking and uh, community violence intervention. Mine has tended to be more advocacy about uh, desirable laws. So a couple of points I try to make to people uh, in introducing this subject, um, I think one of the key points is that when we talk about gun violence and gun safety, we're really talking about quite a number of distinct problems that are all linked together by a particular kind of mechanical device. Um, so this has implications for law and policy in that 
there is not really an opportunity to say, you know, what's the one thing we can do to solve this? So I don't tend to talk in terms of solutions. I talk in terms of reducing risk and harm. And of course, the limitation for us in the United States is sort of twofold as a practical matter. One is the way the U.S. Supreme Court has interpreted the Second Amendment since 2008 to have a recognized right for individuals to own firearms. That wasn't true before 2008, but it has limited what we can aspire to. And then the practical matter of an estimated uh, more than 400 million guns on the loose uh, in far too many people's hands. Um, so we have to deal with those realities as we think about advocating law and policy that would reduce risk and harm. And in understanding that, we think about, well, what are the various facets of this problem? And you can see sort of the list there of the different things we can try to work on. Um, and there are, of course, facts lurking here that many people may not realize, such as the largest number of gun deaths each year are from suicide. I mean, there's been a lot of publicity lately to the fact that um, guns have now become a leading cause of death for young people, uh, teens and children in a way, basically replacing car crashes. And of course, that is extremely disturbing. And some percentage of those, especially with younger children, has to do with just complete carelessness about these dangerous items. Um, but we also know there's other kinds of problems as well. The things people fear most, some people, about crime. Um, but I also have become especially concerned about how firearms in the United States are a threat to democracy, and we see them used to threaten and intimidate voters, candidates, and lawmakers. Uh, and of course, we also see a very racialized kind of viewpoint and rhetoric about uh, guns and gun violence, which unfortunately has cost some young people their lives in the past few days. Um, because there is this connection that has developed between um, guns, images of guns, beliefs in guns, and racialized images of our fellow human beings that um, have led some politicians, I think, to encourage violence uh, within our society and also put people of color at uh, special risk. Um, as we've tragically seen lately. The other word or concept that I would point to that's often broader than we realize is just the notion of when we talk about victims of guns and gun violence, how really broad that is, because it's not just the people who suffer direct injury and death. I mean, we know there are the friends and family, but we also know that this really impacts all of us. People change their behavior. They limit their own liberty out of fear. People have psychological trauma from a sense of vicarious victimization and fear of what they see and hear around them. I mean, I think that's a big issue of concern with students at MSU right now. Um, and as I have said in some settings, uh, I taught at Berkey Hall uh, an evening course and had that shooting occurred on a Thursday instead of a Monday, there's no telling what, how personalized that experience could have been to me on that first floor hallway right next to the entrance. And I think a lot of my students think about this and some of them are, are struggling uh, with it as well. And then there's, you know, practical kinds of harms, you know, to as taxpayers and insurance premium payers uh, and the expense that we put into safety and security 
um, which might be less if we had more control over firearms. And we, as Americans who often don't think about all of the adverse impacts we have on other countries, I think should be keenly aware of the harms that are being experienced in both Canada and Mexico from the trafficking of firearms from the United States to those countries where both countries' firearms would otherwise be much more difficult for people to obtain if not for the sort of, I don't know, unethical profit seekers who are looking for ways to bring the uh, overabundance of American firearms over the borders with little care for how it impacts uh, Canada and Mexico as well. So that's kind of a broad take on how I think about guns and the, the problem of guns. And of course, one could drill down into each of those uh, different bullet points as well. Uh, in thinking about a lot of the discussion in Michigan in the you know past year and a half, of course, the Oxford High School tragedy shook us all up. And then the MSU shootings being as recent as February 13th, um, especially for someone like me in East Lansing and, you know, all of you in the Lansing area as well. Just a shocking uh, event. But I, I would simply note that those events did not create the proposals and the new laws that we've just seen because members of the legislature have been putting in those proposals for years in prior sessions of the legislature. And the polarization on this issue between the political parties had just absolutely stopped any consideration of any, even the most modest gun measure. And so when the legislature flipped what these things, these events did, and the Oxford shooting may have had an impact on some voters in November and the choices they made, that certainly is true, but they really gave some political momentum to this opportunity to enact some gun safety measures. But I would also say, because I'm very concerned and, you know, I. I have a PhD in political science, and so often I have these epiphanies about how naive I am about government and politics because of, you know, I want to believe in democracy and the inevitability of progress. Um, but the anti-democracy features of our system have very significant impacts in a, in a bad way on our ability to advance gun safety law and policy. And we see it in Congress, you know, the structure of the Senate and all those things. But in Michigan, what it means is the actual key event that made the huge difference in our ability to now get some gun safety laws was the voters, not politicians ballot issue that um, eliminated gerrymandering in the state and created an opportunity for fair competitive elections to let the majority's preferences prevail. Uh, and unfortunately we see in Wisconsin and myriad other states, North Carolina, gerrymandering still is limiting the expression of majority viewpoints. Um, Anti-democracy, very adverse to public health and public safety related to firearms in Michigan, we're a little bit fortunate that those people behind that ballot issue were so persistent and successful in what they did, because it has made a real difference in what's happened in our state in the last 100 days. <clears throat> well, I just said all that, not even realizing I had it on the slide coming up, but obviously, there's a lot of anti-democracy things with especially powerful impact on the national level when you have an electoral college where people can become president, even though a majority of the voters chose somebody else. And in the Senate, where the small states have excessive power and can block legislation and can shape who gets on the Supreme Court, um, this is a huge burden for us for a lot of issues, but especially 
true related to gun safety, gun violence, and public health related to uh, firearms uh, injuries. Um, what can we do? How can this change? I mean, it's so hard to amend the Constitution because, you know, I would get rid of the Second Amendment personally if I had the power to amend the Constitution. Uh, I would restructure the Senate. I would have the presidency uh, be by popular vote, not the Electoral College, but I don't have that power. So what I've said in many interviews and podcasts when people say, so what can make a difference? The one thing we know that um, has not been fully utilized is what if we could get more people to get out and vote? Because relative to some other Western democracies, our voting rates are pretty abysmal. Um, what if we could really get people to get out and vote and to have gun safety as a priority when they're choosing between um, candidates. It doesn't do us a lot of good on this policy issue when people say, why don't we do something about guns? But then they vote for candidates based on who they think is gonna tax them less. And they let people in there who are going to blockade action on gun law and policy. How can we get more people registered, more people to vote, more people to see the difference that voting can make and more people to focus on gun safety? Um, I do have a hope uh, as I see young people mobilizing around climate change. Uh, and as we saw people mobilize after the horrific murder of George Floyd, um, that maybe younger generations who will grab onto an issue that really touches them and encourage their peers and be involved in voter registration and getting, getting people to polls, that there will be attendant positive effects for working toward gun safety from these same young people who are concerned about climate change. Even if their original motivation was a different issue, there's the possibility of attendant positive effects there. But I think that's, that's a hard task to get people to vote and increase those voting rates, but it is a thing that is available um to try to work on in order to make a difference where do things stand in michigan well as you know um less than a week ago governor whitmer signed into law universal background checks and safe storage requirements after years and years and years of everything uh having a blockade on the same day, last Thursday, the extreme risk protection order bills passed each chamber and now they need to work out um, the common language so that there will be you know, one bill that both chambers agree on so that Governor Whitmer can sign that third bill. So that's progress. It was a celebratory atmosphere. I was at the signing ceremony. It was a celebratory um, atmosphere. Um, but having studied this for a long, long time, you know, I'm also keenly aware on how modest these laws are. They will make a difference. Um, but in specific areas of the problems that we face, um, in specific cases, they will make a difference. They will save some lives. And that's important. That's worth doing. Um, but of course, I recognize to really make the progress that we'd like to make toward thinking about peace and public health, um, there's a lot more we would need to do. And here, I would just note, there is now a kind of question mark out there about what will happen next with respect to gun safety. So let me just note for you that in Governor Whitmer's State of the State address, she listed three things that she wanted to see done about gun safety. These are the three things. She didn't list anything else. 
Um, and it's raised some concern and speculation about the extent to which the Democratic leadership is going to prioritize additional gun safety measures, or will they now turn their attention and their political capital to other things? Um, so we'll have to see. This, these are all recent developments. I'm not saying they're going to stop here. But there is certainly concern among the people actively involved in talking to the legislature that there's a fear that ticking these three boxes, which are significant achievements, will for the moment be treated as if we fulfilled the promise, we go on to other things, when there are some very obvious things that we can do in addition, or we ought to do, keeping guns away from polling places, getting civilian carried firearms not only out of the Capitol, but completely off Capitol grounds, because concealed carry people can still carry firearms in there, not to mention other things about limiting the types of weapons that are available or the capacity of those weapons. So we'll have to see. I'll just, that tempers my celebration because there's so much more that needs to be done, and I'd like to see the political momentum continue. What I do recognize, the Democrats have very narrow majorities. I don't know if the political leadership who knows these individuals can see that there are members of their caucus who don't want to do more, and therefore they don't have the votes that they would need to do more. I simply don't know. It's so close in the legislature that's possible. But we'll have to wait and see. I don't know what's happening next. I have hopes, but I don't really have expectations because I don't know. Um, here's some examples of some other bills that they could work on. And these are this is not exhaustive. Um, you know, raising the minimum age. Um uh, the measures related to polling places have already passed the com through the committee in the House. I don't know where they are and if the leadership will take them up, having a waiting period, giving uh, local jurisdictions like cities authority to actually have more restrictive rules than the state has. These have all been proposed and we'll have to, we'll have to wait and see. And I, again, I recognize the leadership has a better sense of the pulse of their caucus, and they also have other policy issues they have to address. Um, but certainly this is one of my main priorities. So I'm hoping they push forward and do more. Um, what can individuals do? Uh, and I've talked to some legislative staff people lately and have a renewed sense that contact from the public can make some difference, can make legislators feel as if among my constituents, this is a priority. Among my constituents, this is what they're really watching me to do and as a source of pressure. So there is certainly um, discussion among groups involved with the legislature on this issue about the importance of contacting people who've supported these bills to thank them for their support, because some of them may have been a little tentative if they're in a very kind of battleground district and this wasn't their priority issue, to thank and encourage the five Republicans who voted for safe storage, who crossed party lines because it does create some hope that um, maybe there could be some bipartisan support for some specific things if there was enough encouragement and gratitude for, for those individuals, because you got to presume they're experiencing some hostility from certainly interest groups and constituents uh, on the other side. Um, so calling and emailing to say thanks and to encourage to do more um, is the very immediate kind of action that people can take. 
Uh, even if you're in a district where your legislators are totally on board with doing more things, keeping them aware that this ought to be among the highest priorities and that we appreciate what they've done, but we really want them to do more. It is a concrete thing. It's a small thing, but in a cu cumulative sense, it can have some impact. And I've talked to staff members about how they keep track of calls and emails and all that sort of stuff so that it is an action that one can take fairly easily. And there is a potential for cumulative, beneficial cumulative impact. There are other approaches to gun safety and reducing gun violence. Um, and, you know, as a lot of you may know, I ran for Congress once and I took a broad view of things, of what all the, the attendant benefits would be from universal health care, for example, and I still believe that. Um, but there are other ways in which we can encourage lawmakers to act on issues that are not always viewed as related, but can certainly have beneficial impacts. Certainly, there are groups that are giving a lot of attention to getting uh, increased government funding for neighborhood conflict intervention and community violence reduction programs. And we should always encourage more efforts uh, in this regard, as well as increased kinds of opportunities for young people to use their time productively in ways that would both benefit them and they would enjoy um, because we wanna keep people out of contexts and conflicts and gun carrying behavior that may uh, uh, stem from those things. But certainly expanded access to healthcare, even things like you go for a standard medical appointment and nowadays they ask you, do you feel safe at home? Is there, um, you know, have you experienced violence or what have you? Even those small steps from being able to go to a routine uh, medical appointment may help individuals in identifying, revealing, talking about problems and finding solutions that may help people be removed from uh, risk and harm. And certainly the catastrophic costs of health care for individual families that don't have health insurance are just incredibly compounded when someone has a gunshot injury, which can be catastrophic and as expensive as anything uh, can be. And obviously, we have more attention lately to the need for expanded access to mental health services, which is a good on its own, but could have attended benefits related to some individuals and uh, their use of firearms. And of course, given the number of firearms out there, I mean, it's inevitable we will be spending and thinking about how to make places more secure. You know, MSU, they're adding locks to doors that didn't have locks. And at certain times in the evening, we now need to use our IDs to get into buildings. You know, there's expenses uh, involved here. We can't ignore it. We hate to have an environment where we are locked in and locked down. And hopefully we don't overdo this, but that's an additional thing that is with us as part of this struggle to increase gun safety and enhance public health related to this issue. One of the things that I've talked about uh, is, of course, that Michigan has finally arrived at a point where we can have action. Uh, and we have this system of federalism where other states are ahead of us and they've tried different things. And we need to encourage our policymakers to be cognizant of that and look at the other states as well as look at research that supports things that are done out there. And we need to up with all of our own ideas and reinvent the wheel because we can look at what other 
states uh, have done. Oh, I guess I put that on a slide, didn't I? Um, we can look for examples. And what I have pointed to for the past several years is Virginia. Under the prior Virginia governor, um, after their, and Virginia is an unusual state where the governor gets one four-year term and then the governor's term limit out. So they get more turnover than than we do when you know we have typically had them for eight years lately. But in 2019, uh, billionaire former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg, who is the a chief uh, funder and leader behind every town, which is not now connected to Moms Demand Action, um, they put in money in specific targeted legislative races in Virginia, and they gain control of both houses, both chambers of their, I think it's an assembly called an assembly. And they lined up with the then Democratic governor and very quickly uh, enacted a whole list of laws, new laws. I mean, right off the bat, there were 10, and then they added additional things. And they did this with an element of courage, because as you can imagine, from what we've seen in Michigan as well, they had hundreds of people massed outside the Capitol carrying military-style weapons of war and loudly protesting this. But they went ahead and did it. Thank heavens they didn't have violence over it. But, you know, it speaks to the fact that there are more things we can do. And they ended up banning civilian carried firearms uh, in state buildings and on their state capital grounds. And we're still in the situation where people with military style rifles could mass outside the door of the Capitol with the frightening potential of having a January 6th thing here in Michigan, because how would you stop them when you've got hundreds of people's masked in that way? You've got to have guns farther away from the decision making in our democracy. And I hope our state leaders move forward with that. And these are other kinds of things that um, other states uh, have uh, have done as well, that for us, you know, we should be thinking about these things. That's not reinventing the wheel. It's getting the legislature to devote its energy, its political capital to trying to make these things happen. Now, and I guess so. I hopefully that's positive, right? We've had some positive things happen. We we hope the potential is there to push forward with some other things. We have examples from other states we can draw upon. And now for the downside, the real emerging downside of our political moment, and that has to do with the legal aspects that have developed since last June at the national level. So of course we have the Second Amendment and we have a majority on the Supreme Court that has basically erased the first clause of this single sentence that was not made up of two separable clauses. And we see a real ideological impact in the way that they are interpreting the Second Amendment. Uh, and this is having very adverse effects for the country. But you know, there's a lot of people out there who have their own view of the Second Amendment. It ought to mean I can have a military style rifle. It ought to mean I can carry a military style rifle on campus at MSU or anywhere I want. That's my Second Amendment right. Well, it's not. Okay. And I have to combat that all the time. Where we stand now, basically, the US Supreme Court, which we consider the primary definer of constitutional rights and constitutional law, has had three cases to define the Second Amendment. They're probably going to have more, but this is where we stand now. The first two cases were simply about a right of an individual to have a handgun at home in the house for self-defense. That's a very limited definition of this right. And then in 2022, in June, we now had the Trump appointees on there, and there was an expansion 
but the expansion went this way. Basically, there were about eight states where if you went through the process to be licensed to get that permit to carry a gun in public, there were about eight states left that did what Michigan used to do. And one of the requirements they had maintained that we lost was that you had to give a good reason for why you needed to carry a gun. And if you didn't have a good reason, they could turn you down. Well, what the Supreme Court did was wipe out the ability of states to require people to give a reason. So where it stands now is individuals who are otherwise qualified to get a permit to carry a gun. Otherwise qualified, meaning if your state required you to take classes or to go to a shooting range or to pass a test and do a background check, you know, and Michigan tends to require these elements, um, then you they had to give you the permit without asking you why, if you fulfill all those requirements. Of course, we're at a tragic point in this country where half the states basically don't have requirements anymore. But this is all they did. They didn't say you can carry a military style rifle wherever you want and these other kinds of claims. Any other claims about what the Supreme Court has said are just untrue. They're myth, they're fantasy, they're lies that are being, you know, we have social media and an alternative sources of news that create propaganda. The problem that we face though, Oh, and I just have two slides here to note, even the Supreme Court that changed the meaning of the Second Amendment and made it an individual right, acknowledged that states can regulate. Go back to 2008 and Justice Scalia saying, there's no doubt that you can prohibit firearm ownership and possession by certain categories of people, and forbid firearms in certain places, and you can impose conditions and qualifications on the sale of firearms. It was very clear. They didn't intend to open it up, anybody have any gun anywhere they want. And this gets reiterated with respect to sensitive places in 2022 um, by Justice Thomas acknowledging that you can regulate where guns are carried. And you can be darn sure they're never going to let people carry guns into the U.S. Supreme Court building, no matter how far they go in exposing the rest of us to guns where we work and live. Um, but this does leave in place this notion of sensitive places where regulation can occur. So that's my, my only point here is to say the U.S. Supreme Court has not tossed aside notions of regulation. They have limited and gradually may limit more what can be done. Here's the problem. In their guidance to the lower courts, the majority on the Supreme Court, and I do not think they all thought this through, it's this ideological worship of the founding fathers that they pretend to follow. They instructed lower court judges that when a gun law is challenged as violating the Second Amendment, Lower court judges are supposed to invalidate those laws unless they can find a historical analogy that existed in 1791 or in 1868. You can imagine the chaos this has set loose upon the country. What gun law can survive if you have to find an analogy from 1791 or even 1868? And this has taken off in places like Texas and elsewhere. We haven't seen it in Michigan yet, but I'm sure it's coming. And there are lower court judges trying to develop reasoning to get their decisions outside of this. Um, but this is a big problem. Um, some of the examples, you had a, a judge in Floor and Texas strike down a uh, federal law uh, about uh, barring people who are subject to personal protection orders for violence from having access to firearms. But of course, they look back to the racist 
sexist, misogynistic society of 1791. And what do they find? Lawmakers didn't seem to particularly care about domestic violence, right? Delaware struck down a law trying to regulate ghost guns, untraceable guns made on 3D printers. Oh, there were no laws related to 3D printers in 1868. What a surprise. You can see the ridiculous harm that this does to our ability to have a democracy that can produce laws to advance public health and safety. Um, the most ironic one was Judge Amy Coney Barrett during oral arguments stopped for a minute, and she's part of this group, of course, and stopped for a minute and said, wait, guns at Times Square when there's a million people there on New Year's Eve, that's probably a bad idea. Maybe we should just declare that Times Square is a sensitive place where they can't carry firearms. The problem is her theory doesn't support her practical insight. Um, and indeed, a federal judge has already said New York shouldn't be able to ban guns in Times Square, on subways, at children's summer camps, in mental health facilities. Why? Because those laws didn't exist in 1868. This is really, you know, the Second Amendment as a suicide pact for democracy or something. It really is horrific what's going on. Um, judges are not historians. They're casting about, you know, uh, for things. This is unfamiliar territory, and it is forcing us as a society with respect to guns, not with other issues yet, respect to guns, to have to live under the biases, assumptions, and completely technologically different society um, of 1791 or 1868. This has really gone to ridiculous lengths. And this is just from a decision last June. This is not even a year's worth of lower court decisions. So my hope, I'll call it a prediction, is that a couple justices on the US Supreme Court will come to their senses and go, oops, we have let loose something horrible upon the land and they will accept a case in which they will clarify the ability of states to regulate and walk this back a bit. Uh, my own suspicion is Chief Justice Roberts is one who's likely to do this. And it may be Justice Kavanaugh, the other one, because he's less thoroughly committed to making our society follow what 1791 did. But this is my hope that they will then accept a case, they'll pull back, they'll join with uh, Justices Sotomayor and Kagan and Jackson in pulling back from this historical analysis, which is really having horrific effects. And you can imagine the effects of this guidance in the hands of some of the Trump appointed judges, uh, ju lower court judges in particular, who have an ideological bent toward having guns everywhere. So this is the disturbing thing. It doesn't have as much publicity. I don't think the public is widely aware of it. Stay tuned. We need to watch see what happens, but it is an especially disturbing simultaneous development at a national level, even as we're having positive developments within our state. So I have to stop sharing. Am I back? Did I do it? All right. You did it very well. Good job. All right. Sorry, I lost my unmute button. Thank you, Chris. That was amazing. And you did perfect switching. Okay. Wow. Well, I hope I timed it well <laughs> and I welcome questions, although I probably won't keep, you know, the hand signal and this and that and the other. So I'm happy to rely on uh, Mary or someone else to call on, on people. Um, I we can do that and we can also put them in the chat to anybody who's interested okay. putting questions in the chat and read them do you want us to read the questions to you out loud is that helpful um 
Okay, so now I just turn to the chat because, you know, I'm a technological follower, not a <laughs> leader. Um, but I see this question, do I think ending the electoral college system would help increase the possibility of passing more sane gun legislation? Um, is that coming down the pike? So there are certainly concrete efforts out there with respect to the electoral college. There's this pact that's developed between different states uh, about awarding electoral votes based on popular vote and that sort of thing. That's, to me, important for a wide array of policy reasons, but I don't know that that is the thing that's going to make the difference. Um, we would like to get out from under having presidents who cannot draw the support of a majority of voters. A majority, a large number of voters vote for somebody else, then it means they're less likely to reflect majority preferences. But it's gerrymandering and it's the structure of the Senate that I think in some ways are even bigger um, because we can still have majority preference reflected in some of our presidential elections, even with the Electoral College. We cannot have majority preference reflected when you have the structure of the Senate and its filibusters and the gerrymandering that dictates the outcome, you know, the legislative mix in uh, various states. Did you have another one, Mary? I believe that Mary had a couple yep. of the questions there. Yep. Um, so, okay. This is, what do you think would have a bigger impact focusing on enacting or changing state laws or federal? Well, if you could do federal, that would have a bigger <laughs> impact. It would have a bigger impact. It really would. And that really is the ideal goal um, to have federal laws. You know, think back, you know, we had a federal assault weapons ban, you know, if you can do that stuff at the federal level. Because one of the huge problems, you know, one benefit of federalism is you can look at what other states have done and you can draw examples and say, oh, that's an idea, it's working for them, let's do it here. The downside of federalism is it also helps to defeat many things that are being done in a neighboring state, you know? And the most, you know, obvious examples for a lot of years, studies showed that guns used in crimes in New York City um, very significant per, uh, percentage came from Virginia because Virginia, you know, prior was kind of a, law, a state of non-existent gun laws. And there was just trafficking straight up. What is that? I-95, straight up I-95 on the East Coast to New York City. There was an examination done of um, gun crimes in Chicago and hundreds of guns used in crimes in Chicago came from like three specific gun shops in Gary, Indiana, because Indiana is horrifically lax and it's so easy to transport firearms across state line, lines. So federal is the most desirable way to go for sure, but you gotta take what you can get. And if you can get state action as we have, that's progress. And it also creates the possibility that other states in trying things or moving ahead will create examples that other states will then say, well, let's do that. And this is all going to reduce some risk and harm. Um, federalism doesn't completely defeat what states want to do. Um, but um, certainly, if we could get federal action, that's the way to go. Um, but the filibuster there was the real killer um, when uh, the Democrats had slim majorities, the filibuster really limited what could be done.
Okay, does anyone else have any questions? I don't see any in the, the chat and I want to make sure that everyone gets a chance here. Okay, hey, Crystal. Whoops. <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> Which is basically a yes or no. <laughs> okay. We can promote preventative measures. We may not think of as traditionally gun violence prevention, like increasing funding for mental health support. Um, so you want me to put the slide back up? Is that the request? So I think it's, um, can we post it on our website so that people oh. can use it as a reference? You can post the whole thing, anything you want. You know, all right. So I, for all of you wondering, we'll post the video of this presentation and the PowerPoint slides, which have some great info on them. Anything you want, because, you know, my purpose here is to provide information. Um, the information has a perspective. I have values. I have policy preferences um, that I think are based on my sense of what's best for society. So. You know, I want to share that as broadly uh, as can be. Wonderful. Any ideas on how to increase voter registration? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm not, <laughs> I've not worked in that. I've talked to people who work in that, who've done these kinds of drives and who, you know, part of the challenge is identifying who it is that you think you can increase their registration? Is there a way to efficiently target people who are not registered? Um, and then the issue of how to get them interested. So we have seen various states over time, you know, combine the driver's license with voter registration opportunities. You know, that's one of the kinds of things that um, people do. Uh, there's also, for example, on MSU's campus, there have been democratic political consultants who've done a lot of effective identifying and targeting of students who are not registered to be able to go and touch base with them personally by fellow students to encourage them to register and participate. You know, it's not some parent lecturing you on voting. It's your peer mm -hmm. who's talking about how important this is for the issues of importance to you as a, uh, as a young adult. Um, and I do have hopes that when, you know, March for Our Lives and so, some of these organizations are tapping into the fear and frustration and anger that a lot of young people have um, that uh, encouraging voting is part of that. Um, personally, I could go with more of an Australian model where you find people if they don't vote. Um, <laughs> just because I think our democracy is so lagging but I do know that goes against the rhetoric of liberty in the United States, which is different than the more communitarian focus that you can get in some of our fellow uh, democracies. Um, so I, with the, which gun safety advocacy groups do you think has been most effective and successful? So this is a you know an interesting and important question. Certainly has not been my group because we've kind of shrunk to primarily be a public education entity because we lost some of the veteran activists at the start of COVID, and um, I kind of inherited this on the side, and I'm still working full time. So we've become more of a public education focus. So if you talk today, Moms Demand Action has a very impressive ability to mobilize people. And they're part of 
they're connected to a national organization and a national organization that has resources from whom they can seek advice and support. So I think they have been very important and continue to be important. But there's a new group that emerged in the past two years, and it's called End Gun Violence Michigan. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll claim a little accidental Forrest Gump credit for a very small role in how they emerged to be very effective and prominent recently there was a new episcopal bishop who came to detroit i think maybe two years ago and she came from chicago and if you google gun violence things our website comes up first and she contacted us and wanted to speak to somebody about what's going on with gun safety in michigan i'm new here i was working on that in chicago so i had a long very fruitful uh, zoom meeting with her and that was around the same time as someone who was a very experienced activist on lots of policy issues who had been head of a group called Michigan United. And he contacted me because his view was if the legislature didn't flip, then he wanted to organize a ballot issue, much like voters, not politicians. Um, and I put the two of them together. That was my very small role, but there was some synergy there and they took off because they have a lot of experience and resources, both of them, and organized meetings and organized a lot of different groups to meet together. Uh, and I thought they really emerged here in the past hundred days um, with being in close contact with the legislature and with knowing what was going on in the legislature and who they needed to talk to, to encourage, and who they needed to get meetings with. Um, and I thought they were very uh, influential. And I think they are um, growing in terms of their uh, importance uh, as a relatively young organization that has already brought in a lot of different groups. Um, so I've been very impressed uh, with them. With respect to this question about um, Michigan and a red flag law. So Governor Whitmer signed the safe storage and universal background checks because the extreme risk protection order law, which is sometimes referred to as a red flag law, was not through both chambers as of the morning of last Thursday, but later in the day on Thursday, it did get through both chambers, but they have two slightly different versions. So where we are now is on the verge of having that become law. They just need to work out the wording between the two chambers versions, and then uh, Governor Whitmer can sign it in law. So we don't literally have it yet, but we are as close as you can come to having those final details in order for it to be a law. Okay, there's a lot of silence. I know everybody has more questions. <laughs> Okay, something that I would like to throw out to everyone, um, Mary and I, prior to the meeting um, or the program, we brought in some links from the different how to how to contact your legislator, how to find your legislator, et cetera. I'm going to post them in the chat box now. There is one, two, three, there's four different links, um, and I'm hoping that that will help you as you um, try to reach out to individuals and provide your thoughts. Did that go through? There it goes. Okay. Can I, let me just add one more comment because I, you know, I read a lot of news, commentary, studies, 
related to gun safety, gun violence. And I read an interesting interview the other day, um, and I can't think of the name of the author, but he's written two books about uh, gun issues. And he was more optimistic than mm. um, I tend to feel on a day-to-day -day basis in his long-term view of this um, for a couple of reasons. One is the National Rifle Association has lost some of its um, power. They have been involved in some significant internal fights and scandals about how their leaders were spending money on vacations and clothes and all that kind of corruption that can occur um, when there's a lot of money involved. Uh, and his optimistic sense was that their peak of power has passed. They still have influence, but their peak of power has passed and they are somewhat in decline. At the same time, his take on things is that Mitch McConnell in the Senate and some other Republican senators um, realize that because of incidents like Oxford, and we can name a lot of other ones elsewhere in the country since then, right? That they are starting to lose um, upper middle class suburban voters who are increasingly prioritizing this issue. And that he thinks is why McConnell and 15 Republican senators voted for that gun law package that President Biden signed. And it was modest, but they hadn't been able to get stuff through Congress in years because of the filibuster. Uh, and he thinks that pragmatically, because of the very, you know, what seems like an increase in mass shootings and school shootings and the publicity surrounding them and having them hit suburban places like Oxford um, has made this rise as a salient issue to some segment of suburban voters who previously were regarded as dependably in the Republican camp for financial or tax policy reasons. And so he perceives a softening uh, that may lead to some bipartisan uh, agreement. Sadly, uh, you know, that's the optimistic part. The bad part is it's also based on the inevitability of continuing horrific tragedies, um, that this is going to put more pressure on some Republicans representing suburban districts to moderate their previous absolutism. I don't know. We'll see. I like to hear optimistic things because I don't feel optimistic lots of days. So, but I just read that the other day and it did make me think and want to think in a more, a little more long-term way. You know, I'm 65. I have grandchildren. I'm not going to be around who knows, right? But obviously I'm very worried about my grandchildren. So I do look for optimism and hope that it isn't false optimism. Well, Chris, I wanna say thank you for such an informative and thought provoking program. This has been absolutely wonderful. We're so grateful to you for sharing um, your insights and your and your knowledge with us this evening and for spending the evening with us. We're very appreciative um, and we're very appreciative of your, your time. I mean, please know that uh, we understand um, how much time this took for you for, for doing everything. And, and I can hold up a stack of papers that need to be graded right now. <laughs> if I could distribute them to all of you to help me, I would be very tempted. That's what April's all about for me. 
I'll go over right now. I'll I'll help with the grading. That, May not be proper, but I'll help. That's okay. That's my okay. red pen's ready. <laughs> All right. But anyway, I thank you for the opportunity. Um, and I also thank you because you know you're a visible group. Um, and the the people involved with you I know are very concerned and committed, and it's not sort of uh, you know curiosity and ambivalence it is very much about making our society a, a place where we do have justice equality and peace that we would really want everyone to hope for um even though we see some people don't but it's worth working for so i do thank you for all that you do thank you chris that was wonderful <laughs> I would also like to, to give a very nice and special thank you to everyone who has attended tonight, um, especially to anyone who was able to make a donation to MPT for this program. Your dollars literally help keep our, do our doors open. Um, our nonprofit is very, very much donation driven. Um, if you would like to help support our work and have not done so yet, um, I'm going to actually ask Mary if she would be uh, willing to put that link into the chat. Um, and again, I want to have a very heartfelt, direct appreciation to Chris and for everything for from tonight. It was just wonderful. Um, Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, you are very welcome. And let's all pray for a little bit more of the gun legislation and and um, helping us achieve those or achieve that uh, peaceful nation that we really want to have. Yes. And I yes. thank you for giving us concrete ideas of what to do. Some of those backdoor ideas make sense, but um, you don't think of it necessarily when you're thinking um, gun policy. You're absolutely right. Um, health care is a key issue. Mental health care is a key issue. And um, and that will bring that to the forefront. And uh, whether it's false optimism or not, I'd rather have some optimism than none. So thanks. Well, that's true. I agree. I agree. <laughs> and I am, I am fundamentally an optimistic person. Um, but depends on the day, how much sleep I got, what I read in the paper is a little bit of this. But I am fundamentally optimistic. Yes. Right. I've seen many things in my lifetime I never thought I would see. And I mean, Barack Obama, Nelson Mandela, the Berlin Wall, what have you. And I always remind myself of that uh, as part of my optimism for the future. Amen. Well, thank you. Thank okay. you, friends. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank Take you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.